recording okay good uh, good morning to everyone nice to have you here we have a sponsor for today's uh, shiur on vayakel pekude so we're going to thank haim and mirel musaji it's to commemorate the yard site of mirel's brother yosef ben shaul hakohen zerchrono libracha and haim's mother sarah bat yosef so thank you mirel thank you haim Neshama Shalav Naliya, we thank you, and the Neshamas indeed should benefit from our words of Torah that we're going to discuss here. So, to appreciate uh, a little bit this uh, this parsha, we're going to have to do a very uh, brief review of what got us here. What got us here? So, if you look at the last four weeks. Uh, we've heard in great detail over and over uh, again about the construction of the tabernacle. And we should be by now experts. After reading Parashas Vayakil Pekude, and you heard every single detail regarding the wood and the gold and the silver sockets, God Almighty expects expertise from us. Now, what we're going to focus on is the fact that the parashat truma and tetzaveh is where the Almighty guides Moshe. And he tells Moshe, listen, this is what you are going to tell the people of Israel to make. A tabernacle, garments, fine. And then... Uh, in bar, the beginning of Parshat Kitisa, right as Moshe Rabbeinu ends that period of getting instructions, God Almighty tells him, just by the way, meaning I, 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 sometimes I envision it, that this statement that was given to Moshe in Parshat Kitisa, where God Almighty tells him, by the way, remember there's something called Shabbat, right? So you see the order that he is first commanded on every single detail regarding the construction. And then at the tail end, right before he makes his way down the mountain, God says to him, by the way, there's something called Shabbat. And it appears that God is telling him, although it is very important for me that they make this structure, remember on Shabbat, they should rest. They should not be involved in the work of construction during Shabbat. And I envision it as if Moshe already was already holding the luchos, holding the tablets. And God says to him, it appears like an afterthought, by the way, uh, remember there's something called Shabbat. And right afterwards, Moshe makes his way down and that's when the trouble begins. So the order of things, when God communicates with Moshe is first, he is told about the construction and the tabernacle and only afterwards is he told by the way don't do it on shabbat now then we read last week about the sin of the golden calf the fall of our ancestors and now it's time to start fixing things up which is a good thing and in parashat vayakel we're we're actually uh moshe rabbeinu communicates to the people of what they need to do and he hires uh these expert craftsmen in this week's parsha, first Shabbat is communicated. Vayakel Moshe kol adat bnei Israel. He gathers the whole nation, and yes, the goal was to inform them that it is time to build this very important structure for the people of Israel. But beforehand, he notes: listen, do work, get involved in the prog- in, in the in the project for sheshet yamim for six days. However, on the seventh day, you should rest. So now the order is reversed. Here they are told about Shabbat before they are given all the details of the construction. So the question I'm going to deal with, the question we need to address is why is the order reversed? Like why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu was told about Shabbat from God at the end, and here it decides to make it number one. Guys, we're going to be telling you about a very important project, but please remember, even before I mention any detail, not on Shabbat. So that's the question that I would like to 
uh, clarify or to address. So, you know, Shabbat uh, plays a very important uh, role in our identity. And it's not a coincidence that when you want to talk about a, a Torah Jew that uh, is committed to observance, we identify them as a Shomer Shabbos. I'm Shomer Shabbos is a saying, right? I'm Shomer Shabbos. You can't schedule uh, me at the bowling alley on, on Shabbos because I'm Shomer Shabbos, okay? Shabbos is not just of great value for the day itself, but it really identifies us throughout the week. Throughout the week, it gives us that identity. Uh, we say today is Yom Sheni B'Shabbos. We start thinking about Shabbos. We plan things during the week. We plan our travel. In the olden days when we would travel, we would go ahead and make arrangements to be sure not to travel on Friday wherever possible. Shabbos really guides uh, the Torah Jew how to practice their Judaism throughout the week. Now, there is a dispute between Shammai and Hillel regarding our food purchases during the week. So listen to this. So the Talmud tells us, Shammai Hazaken, the great Shammai, Shammai the elder, the Talmud notes, whenever he would eat during the week, it was in the honor of Shabbat. What does that mean? So the Talmud tells us that he would go to the marketplace on Sunday and he would find an animal or a product or he would find something good. And this was an item that will last until Shabbat. So Shammai would purchase it on Sunday with Shabbat in mind. Now, Next day, he would make his way to the marketplace and find something even better. So he would purchase on Monday the food item or the animal or the chicken and designate it for Shabbat. So he would come home and he would eat that which he chose yesterday for Shabbat. Now that he was able to upgrade and find an item of better quality, so he would eat that which was purchased on Sunday he would eat it on Monday for the sake of Shabbat, that the better item of Monday should be for Shabbat. So it comes out what he's sitting and eating for lunch on Monday, in some ways is actually honoring Shabbat. Tuesday, he would go back to the marketplace on the same exercise. He would find something better, come back home, eat that which was designated for Shabbat, purchase Monday on Tuesday, so all his eating was for the honor of Shabbat. That was Shammai. Okay, so it comes out that the goal is if you find something good, right? Something that will last, obviously. Like don't go ahead and start uh, uh, purchasing your zucchini on Sunday because it might not be good by Shabbat. But those things that are going to last, canned goods or a herring that is pickled, you go to Costco and you pick up a, a giant jar of herring that is 75% onion and you want to go ahead and designate it for Shabbat, that's a beautiful practice. You are acting like Shammai. But then the Talmud notes, Hillel had a different approach. Hillel, kol <clears> ma'asav <throat> l'shem shamaim. Hillel would purchase something on Sunday, a good food, he would eat it on Sunday. And the same on Monday. And the same on Tuesday. He didn't have this approach of using all his uh, eating for the sake of Shabbat. And he would declare, Baruch Hashem Yom Yom, you know, God will bless us every single day. So Hillel had a different approach. Now, let's try to analyze why did Hillel not follow the school of Shammai? In other words, it's a nice thing to buy things for Shabbat, a nice chocolate bar, a nice via coffee that you could use in a klish lishi. Like, why does Hillel not follow the school of Shammai in this detail? So Rashi was of the opinion that Hillel was a man. This is Rashi's analysis of Hillel's behavior. Hillel was a man of great faith. So when he would walk in the marketplace on Sunday and find something good, he had faith that God Almighty is going to provide for him something good later in the week for the sake of Shabbat. So he enjoyed it on Sunday. That's how Rashi explains 
Hillel's attributes. So Rashi walks away from inspired by Hillel's faith. He's a man of faith that he trusts that God Almighty will get him good things for Shabbat. Chatam Sofer, on the other hand, the Chatam Sofer, he has a different, a very different approach. Very, very different approach. Now, to appreciate the Chatam Sofer, I have to share with you a little bit about my personal journey, a very personal journey, which I've shared in the past. But to appreciate that journey, you have to understand, and that's something that uh, we know by now, there are different paths in Judaism. There are different approaches. There are different schools. And they all work, by the way. Like anyone that thinks that they have the only philosophy that is correct in their analysis and practice of Judaism, I have some news for you. There are many correct ones. And what is good for one Torah Jew is not good for another Torah Jew. You have to know yourself. It's extremely important, extremely important to know self. And if for me, the intellectual resources of Judaism uh, are, are the ones that uh, inspire me. So I, I follow that school. If, uh, if there's someone that is more on the emotional end of things, they should follow that school. So there are many, many different schools. So I'm gonna share with you a journey that I went through uh, where I was able to interact with very great people from different schools. And at some point there was a level of confusion and it works as follows. I went uh, to a yeshiva in Chicago, the Tells Yeshiva, with some very inspiring Roshe Yeshiva. Tremendous Torah, Torah scholars, people who did things for the sake of heaven, uh, heroes in preserving Judaism for the next generation. I have a tremendous amount of respect. So at one point, uh, the head of the yeshiva, Rabbi Avram Chaim Levin, Zecher Tzadik Livrocha, at uh, what point in his life, he went to Israel for, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks and a couple of months, and this, this occurred uh, I think in the late 60s, he went to Israel. And it's been noted that when he came back, it changed him. In other words, he, he, be, he became a little bit of a different person due to the fact that he interacted with his wife's grandfather, a rabbi in Bnei Brak, by the name of Rabbi Yechetzka Levinstein. Okay? Rabbi Levinstein. What was, what was so significant about my Rosh HaYeshiva's interaction uh, with his wife's grandfather, Rabbi Levenstein, that changed him? Uh, Rabbi Levenstein was a very spiritual person, but he came from the Musser school. He came from the Musser school. He was one of the greatest Ba'alei Musar teachers and one who practiced the Musser path. The Musser path was one where a person recognizes his human traits and is very, very careful on being sure that those natural tendencies don't take control of the person. In other words, we have knowledge of, about what our responsibility is about. We have to go ahead and encourage ourselves and guide ourselves that the intellect should overcome the natural tendencies. Okay, so for the real Musarite, when he sits down for a meal, and th this meal is, is very, very appetizing, right? Some really homemade herring and some crackers that taste delicious. In other words, something that's really, really tempting. So for the Musarite, He's going to sit down and look at it and say to himself the following. Part of my excitement from these dishes is due to the fact uh, that in some ways I'm like an animal. In other words, the animal is very enticed when the meal is placed in front of him. I have within me tendencies that come from the fact that I'm a human being. And the fact is that we humans do share a lot of our DNA with animals. So this is a problematic drive. Because intellectually, due to the fact that my goal is to grow spiritually, I should only be using the physical world to the extent that it assists me in remaining healthy and growing spiritually. 
So therefore, their attitude towards the plate is one that they, they view it as little bit as, believe it or not, as an enemy. So it was noted that Reb Yecheskel Levenstein, when he would sit down for a meal and he would eat food that he would enjoy, he would leave over some, meaning to, exp- or to go ahead and practice that self-control. I am not going to go ahead and allow myself to, com- to eat all the food because that indicates I'm not in control here of myself. For Rabbi Cheskel, it was important to always be in control, always be mindful. I'm eating, and yes, you know, obviously appreciated and was grateful to God for the good food, but the goal was don't allow those physical tendencies to take control of self. Now, when you interact with such a person, and they are completely for the sake of heaven, it is inspiring. So my Rosh Shiva came back and was, he was inspired by such practices. I don't know if he adapted them fully or not, but it was a philosophy that I always felt and tells that when they talk about physical pleasure and enjoying the world, it was always with an approach that, you know, there's something there that's imperfect. It's not the ideal. Ideally, don't let the physical ple- pleasure be that which guides you. Fine. At some point, as I matured, and again, this is something that as a young man, uh, I, you know, you interact with people that are your guides and they have an attitude. So it, you, it, it's absorbed into you. Later in life, I interacted with people that come from a very, very different school. For example, uh, we moved to Chile. This is after Miriam and I were married. And we moved to Chile and we were guided there by one of the most incredible uh, uh, individuals, probably of the late 20th century, a person that I was always in awe with. His name was Rabbi Shimshin Pincus. Rabbi Pincus. Zetzal, Zechar Tzavik Livroch. Now, Rabbi Pincus was a, a unique Jewish thinker. His works, uh, you could find them in English and in Hebrew in our library here, Rabbi Pincus. Uh, he was a deep thinker, a Baal Machshava, people that, a person that thought through all areas of Jewish law extremely brilliant and he had a unique blend because when it came to his practice of mitzvot he was very strict it was a brisker but at the same time he was influenced by some hasidic thoughts which emphasizes the idea that don't look at the gifts that exist in the world as enemies to your spirituality see them as a vehicle of growth In other words, if there's a wonderful glass of wine or a cup of coffee or a good dish and you are enjoying it, don't look down at it. Don't see it as an enemy. Realize, meditate how incredible it is that God Almighty provided it for you. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. But as you enjoy it, make a bracha and be thankful to God. Make a bracha before and after. And realize that this is a way of connecting and appreciating the Almighty. That was his approach. And it manifested itself in many ways, like he would bring, when he, he would come down to Chile, and at the time there were no uh, kosher chocolates in Chile, so he was careful to bring for the Kolo guys that they have uh, access to these chocolates or marshmallow cups, whatever it was that uh, I was able to enjoy in my mid-20s that uh, I, I can't eat now. So point is, it was a very different philosophy. So it could be confusing for some. Wait a second. How can it be the same Judaism of Rabbi Chetzke Levenstein and Rabbi Shimshim Pincus? But I learned there are different schools. There are different schools. And it is important to be aware of those different schools because then you could be inspired and appreciate those like Rabbi Levenstein. But at the same time, you could say that for me personally, I'm going to live my life where I'm going to appreciate good things. And my goal is to enjoy the coffee every morning. Obviously, I'm going to focus on the bracha that I'm, I recognize that is from the Almighty and I'm going to enjoy those good foods and delicacies uh, that I have every single Shabbos and I'll see it as a gift from above. So these are the different schools. These are the different schools. However, the good Torah Jew does more than just recognize those different schools, but brings them both together brings them both together. And what what we're going to go ahead and as we analyze Hillel's behavior, and remember, Hillel, in the words of the Talmud, 
Kol ma'asav l'shem shamayim. He did everything for the sake of heaven. Comes the Chatam Sofer. Now listen carefully. Comes the Chatam Sofer. And he says the following. For Shammai to retain his uh, spiritual level, he needed Shabbat. He needed Shabbat. And therefore, everything he ate was having Shabbat in mind. Obviously, on Shabbat, we all understand that it's the greatest mitzvah to have enjoyable food. Shammai kept that spirit of Shabbat throughout the week. Hillel, on the other hand, notes the Chatam Sofer, was able, in the words of Ramosha Sofer, that all achilato vehanaat gufo, even beyom chol, even during the week, was like a korban la Hashem. In other words, Hillel was a person that took that approach. And you have to remember, Hillel was one who told his students that if a person takes care of their physical body, goes to the bathhouse, right? And you take care of yourself, you brush your teeth. You're doing a mitzvah, the greatest mitzvah, because mitzvahs without Jewish people performing them are not mitzvahs. So we, the human being, and how much more so the Jew, we are important, right? Hill was the one that declared as he would enter into the celebrations of the Simchat Bet Shoeva. If I'm here, everyone's here. Everyone has to feel important. That was Hillel's message to his students. You are important. And if you are important, take care of yourself. And if you eat a meal and the meal is there and giving pleasure to yourself, and obviously you're doing for the sake of heaven to appreciate the creator, to recognize him, and also that it gives you the strength and ability to do good after you go ahead and get the nutrients that you need for survival. It is a great mitzvah. And for Hillel, says the Chatam Sofer, everything he ate was like a korban la Hashem. It was a great deed. So therefore, when you have the opportunity to fulfill a mitzvah now, there is a, world, a rule that you don't delay it, right? If I could go ahead and make a call and make someone happy, I shouldn't push it off to tomorrow, I should do it now. For Hillel, since everything he consumed was for the sake of heaven and a korban, he shouldn't be delaying it for Shabbat. Now has value. Hillel, the, Tor, the Talmud tells us, Kol ma'asav l'shem shamayim. everything he did was a mitzvah. And we, we, we could really appreciate, or I could appreciate the Hillel approach after interacting with a person like Rab Shimshin Pincus. Enjoy it, right? You have wonderful food, right? We would sit there in Chile, the Shalashudis in, in Chile, was of fresh avocados. Uh, there was one of the Kolo fellows who was from Israel, had an expertise in spices. So he used to make a salmon that with cumin. And I fell in love with cumin since then. I love cumin. So the shalashudas there was a sudas malachim. And of course, all the other meals, you know, at, at, you know, there were challenges in getting kosher products there, but the food made was fresh and always delicious at home. So Rabbi Shem Shempigas would say, enjoy it. This is what you're supposed to do. And when I read the words of Hillel and I read the explanation provided by the Chatam Sofer, I envision Rabbi Shem Shempigas telling us, enjoy, take care of yourself. Realize that it's a tool to connect to God. Fine. And that's a path that I think we all could take into our life. However, we still have to remember Shammai. And we still have to remember that, you know what, true, in Judaism, you're supposed to enjoy the world. There's an incredible statement that the Jerusalem Talmud makes, that after 120, God is going to turn to us and say, why did you not enjoy a specific food? Meaning if there was a wine that you had access to, and you were able to enjoy it, but you said, you know what, I don't want to enjoy the world too much. God is going to say, why didn't you enjoy it? I, I gave it to you, right? It's like insulting a parent. A parent makes a nice piece of cake. You got to eat it, right? Or especially if it's uh, in-laws. You got to eat it because you don't want to insult. God Almighty says, I, I, I made an incredible world. Look at the fruits and vegetables, right? Look at the wines that are produced. Uh, what, what could be better than a good cup of coffee? Enjoy it and recognize me. God wants that. A hundred percent true. But we still have to be careful you know uh my older brother my older brother had a, a colleague a friend 
And it, it, it was a fellow who was uh, financially stable. I think he was single. And my brother shared with me that, that this fellow, right, who has achieved a lot of things in whatever industry he was involved, had a very interesting goal in life. And his goal was to taste a knadel in every kosher restaurant that makes them throughout the planet. That was his goal. Okay, so he had like a list and he did research. Now, there is nothing wrong with a good knadel if you like it. Right? And, and if it's not too hard, right? If it's one that when you put the spoon in, it flies out, please avoid it, right? And there appears to be an art in making the soft knadel. I don't know anything about it. Nothing wrong with enjoying a good knadel. But to say that that's your goal, I don't know. In other words, we could do such incredible things in life. For those who are intellectual, there's studies. For those who have the ability of bringing happiness to others, right? You know, you contact people or people who, who, who make contributions uh, uh, to communal organizations, to duckles. The list is very, very long of some very impressive people. People sometimes, unfortunately, don't recognize how much good they're doing. When people volunteer for organizations, for shuls, right? It could be a major pain uh, to be involved, but you still do it because you know you know what? There's value here. Uh, I'm doing something. It's an organization I believe in. It's duck I believe in. The school I believe in. That is a project that gives guidance and meaning in life. To make the knadel a goal, I don't know. It, it could be taking Hillel a little bit too far. And that's why, by the way, even though we just studied Hillel and Shammai, when you open Shulchan Aruch, when you open, you know, that which guides us how to practice our Judaism, and we look about the laws of preparing for Shabbat, believe it or not, Shammai's opinion is shared. Usually we reject Shammai, not here. It, is a, it appears that we're being told, yes, it is good to follow Hillel. It is good to enjoy the world. But be a little bit careful. Be a little bit careful because you could slip into an area where if that becomes your whole goal, right? If, if it's only about dessert, if life is all about the next piece of cake or chocolate or, or, or bagel, like there must be more to life. Please, there must be more. Shabbat protects us. That's, that's really the key here. You know what protects a person from slipping down that goal, which is not really an achievement and not, we're not really uh, uh, illuminating the world the way, the way we should? Shabbat. Because on Shabbat, yeah, we enjoy the good food. And if throughout the week we're thinking, and if I put aside, if I go ahead and get a nice bottle and I say, this is for Shabbat, if I live my life where Shabbat is really that, that, that core, that hub that gives me guidance of the physical world and it tells, and I tell myself, I'm going to save something special for Shabbat. Shabbat protects you from falling. Okay, that's the idea. Shabbat protects you from falling. Now, with that information, I think we can understand very, very well that as Parshat Vayakel begins, and we're building a tabernacle, and we're building eventually a temple, and we're building Jewish homes. The process of building, of building, makes its appearance right here. We Jews are building. As we build our life and we appreciate the world, please enjoy. There's so many good things that we can enjoy and recognize that this is not something that came into existence on its own, but it's the handwork of the Almighty. As we build, and this is a partial of rebuilding, you need Shabbat in the beginning. So our question was, why was Shabbat only mentioned after? Why was Moshe Rabbeinu only informed about Shabbat after all the details of the tabernacle? And here it's the first thing. In the new world, after the fall, and yes, we had a fall with the sin of the golden calf, and we became the humans we are familiar with. We need that protection from Shabbat. Shabbat protects us in so many ways. You know the statement of, of Bialik that, more than the Jewish people kept Shabbos, Shabbos kept the Jewish people. And those that make Shabbat a priority, right, to honor it appropriately, to go ahead and have the designated foods and the designated clothes and the good suit, whatever it is, they were able to build. And that's why we are in existence 3,400 years later.
because we started the process of rebuilding with Shabbat. That's why it's the beginning of this gathering in this week's Parsha. Now, so that's really the beginning of the Parsha, but obviously we have to touch upon some other things. So there are two other things I would like to talk about. Number one, who were the project managers of the Mishkan? Who were the project managers? So the project managers were number one, Bitzalel, Ben Uri, Ben Hur, Lemate Yehuda, a fellow named Bitzalel, a craftsman, creative, spiritual, all the qualities you need for the construction of the Mishkan of the Tabernacle. And he was in the tzel, he was in the shade, the protection of Kel of God. His father's name was Or, Ur, Light. So obviously a person that illuminates and inspires. And the other project manager was Aholiav ben Achisamach. Aholiav, not a popular Jewish name. Aholiav, the son of Achisamach. And he was from the tribe of Dan. He was from the tribe of Dan. In the past, uh, we've talked about the fact that there's something quite incredible here because the Jewish nation at that time, uh, the average person felt a deep connection to members of his tribe. Like today, we don't really know uh, for a fact or for sure who we are descendants of. And I don't think it makes a big difference if you identify someone that is from Naphtali or from Binyamin. I think we're all okay. But at that time, it did make a difference. They were living with members of their tribe. They identify, perhaps they had their own cuisine, Berves. The tribe of Dan at that time was, you know, I'm not going to say they carried a chip on their shoulder, but it was not the tribe of leadership, of honor. Uh, you have to remember as well that Dan was, was the son of one of the maidservants. And yes, the people of Israel uh, had that in mind. In other words, it was something they were aware of. So while Yehuda was on the top, the leader, Dan was viewed as the one on the bottom. But God Almighty needs to communicate to the people of Israel that it doesn't work like that. There's no such thing. You know, your attitude that you have is something that has to be uprooted. And it makes no difference to me because when I'm going to build, when I'm going to inspire you and I'm going to guide you to build this structure, the project managers must be a partnership between the tribe of Yehuda and the tribe of Dan. Very important here. And if you look very carefully at the name of Aholi Av, Ben Achis Samach from the tribe of Dan, while the tribe, the members of the tribe of Dan perhaps felt disconnected from the nation, the tent that they created was like the father figure that brought them together. Ohali, my tent is like a father. And my brother is one I rely on. So we've talked in the past about these, these details. But I would like to focus, it's a, if you do have the text in front of you, you can read it. Otherwise, I'll read it for you. When the verse introduces this project manager from the tribe of Dan. So it first talks about Bitzalel, and then the verse says the following. This is verse 34 of chapter 35. So it's 35, 34. So the verse tells us about Bitzalel, Ulehorot Natan Belibo, God gave him the ability to teach. God gave Bitzalel, prestigious guy, by the way, according to tradition, right? He's also the great grandson of Miriam. So he's from the fa family of Levi, Yehuda, real Yichus. You know, like people walk around, you know, I'm a Soloveitchik, I'm, I'm a Katzel like I come from one of those prestigious families. Clearly, Bitzalel is from a very, very prestigious family. Now, as a project manager, it's not enough to know how to do things. You have to inspire others. So the text tells us that this Bitzalel, Lehorot Natan Beli God Almighty, gave him the ability to teach. Okay. Now, 
who, and he did it together with in other words, when the verse introduces for us his partner from the tribe of Dan, it starts off by telling us that he had the ability to teach, to inspire. Bitzalel was able to inspire, and he did the project together with Oholiav. Now, my question is, if the text wants to tell us that he did the project together, it should have said Bitzalel did it with Olihav, and they taught. But for some reason, the text decides in one verse to tell us that Bitzalel was a good teacher. He was a good teacher. And he was able to do the project together with Oholiav. Meaning something, for some reason, the text wants us to know or to link his ability to teach, his ability to teach with the fact that he did his project together with Aholihav from the tribe of Dan. Why is it so? Why is it so? So, you know, people are born with tendencies. Some of, some, some of us have tendencies that are problematic and we have that challenge that we have to overcome them. Uh, some of us have different challenges. We all have our challenges. Everyone has to work out to become a better person uh, with their nature. Among the problematic traits that uh, we've identified by people are people that are judgmental. Judgmental. Uh, they, uh, in other words, they, they, they develop this outlook of how the perfect person has to look or be. And if they see someone that doesn't fit into this paradigm and to this image they have, they look down at them. They're not as good as me. And it's no good. It's not good. And uh, sometimes it was the, the, the byproduct of people that were successful and their parents were successful and they came from a prestigious family and then when they need to uh, interact with others that are not like them, they look down at them. You know, sometimes I, I look at, I, I, I read up a lot about great rabbinic figures of the past. And some of them, some of those great rabbinic figures, I could trace their descendants into the 20th century. And unfortunately, in many cases, they're very far from Judaism very, very far from Judaism, right? Uh, like with, you know, whatever you want to say about Yitzhak Rabin, no one would call him the great Torah scholar Yitzhak Rabin, right? And to think about the fact that he was a descendant of one of the greatest rabbinic figures in the beginning of the 19th century. And there's a long list. And sometimes I wonder if, again, I don't want to judge these great rabbis and figures, but sometimes I wonder if, if perhaps they look down at others and that indicated a, a, a flaw in their commitment because if my Judaism is valuable due to the fact that I'm better than the others, so deep down you're not, value, you're not valuating what you are doing. I don't have to compare myself to someone else if I deeply value what I have. But if I have a great cup of coffee, I don't have to start driving by Tim Horton and saying, ha ha, my coffee is better. I don't need it because I know it's good. So the one who does need to drive by Tim Horton, it indicates that uh, his coffee is not so great. You know, if you have to start comparing. People who are judgmental are not going to inspire the next generation. If you look down at a student, if you look down at them, don't expect them to be inspired. Right? If you think you are great because you are royal, do be royal, right? Be careful because someone might talk to Oprah about you, right? You have to be very, very, very careful. If you think that you are great, you are the greatest, you're making a country. Believe me, it doesn't work like that. And, and, and it's interesting. And I mentioned, you know, you look at the uh, uh, rabbinic figures and their descendants. It is something that I feel deep down is a problem. <laughs> Betzalel ben Uri ben Chur was not just a brilliant craftsman. He was a teacher, 
a good teacher, lehorot natan belibo. He inspired others. He inspired others. Do you want to know why he was able to inspire others? Because he worked within Aliyah ben Achisamach Lematedan. He was able to work and respect and saw only good in someone that came from a family that did not have that yichus. Someone that came from the family of Dun. The one who sees value in others and doesn't judge them, and doesn't look down at them, and doesn't feel he's better than them, even though he comes from the most prestigious family, he is the one that could teach. The verse tells us Bitzalel was great. He was lehorot natam belibo. God inspired him and gave him the tools to go ahead and teach. But that is because he was able to work with another person. And he respected that other person. He never, ever looked down at anyone. When you look down at others, you're not going to teach. And you know there, there, there are stories of, of people who worked at, work in prison, work with inmates. And once in a while, you hear stories of inmates that are released and they get on a track in life of success. They could work. They could overcome the all. They could overcome those challenges that we could only imagine led them to prison. And often, as they are interviewed, they give credit to someone that worked with them, some social worker in prison that worked with them. And what they repeat over and over again is that they never judged. They, I never felt that they are looking down at me. I never felt that they are better than me. They treated me like a human being. They saw in me a divine spirit. Lehorot natan belibo, because you could work with someone from the tribe of Dan. That's what we're being told. And it's obviously the most important message for all humans. You want to inspire others. You want to interact with others. Feel good about yourself for what you are doing. Don't feel good about yourself because you are better than someone else. Because that's a problem. It's a problem that, again, some people have more of it than others. Some people, simply, it's their nature. And it's a challenge, but you got to work on it. You got to become one who understands we're all valuable. Never judge the other person. See the good in them. See the good in them. Then you'll be a very, very good teacher. Because the student senses, you know what? This is a person that cares about me. And even if I've made mistakes, they're not going to look down at me. Lehorot natan belibo, because he's able to work with a Danite. Okay, that's piece of information number two. I like I like ending off uh, the any discussion with Pekude, with Bayakel and Pekude, uh, with a fascinating statement that the rabbis make in the Talmud. In, now, you know, the last seven days of the month of Adar, the last seven days of the last of the month of Adar, which started yesterday are known as the Shivat Yemei HaMiluim. What are they? So the tabernacle became a, a functional structure on the first of Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. On the seven days leading to it, you know, they went through these dry runs of putting it up and taking, down, taking it down. During those seven days, Moshe Rabbeinu served as the Kohen. He served as the Kohen. So it was a unique role he had because for seven days he acted like a Kohen, even though afterwards when the structure became operational, he was no longer a Kohen. So the Talmud asks the following question. You know, we know we're given all these details regarding the garments of the Kohen and the Kohanim. But the Talmud wonders, shimesh Moshe Rabbeinu kol shivat miluim. What did he wear? So the Talmud tells us that they have a tradition that he wore a chaluk lavan. Chaluk lavan. Fine, nothing wrong with a, a white uh, a, a robe. But then the Talmud adds, eh, adds, she'en bo imra. It didn't have a cuff. It didn't have a cuff. Now, why did it not have a cuff? Like, what's the significance of Moshe Rabbeinu's garment not having a cuff? 
So to understand it, we have to go to a Mishnah. There's a Mishnah tracted Shkalim that talks about the funds that were in the temple. And they sat in actual coins. They didn't have Bitcoin. So they had actual coins sitting in a chamber. And a Kohen would make his way into that chamber to remove funds to purchase sacrifices. The Mishnah tells us that they were very, very careful that the Kohen walking in not be wearing anything that as he walks out, one would suspect that he took some of the money for himself. So therefore, he would not be wearing his tefillin. He would not be wearing, obviously, a belt that has a pouch. And also, he wouldn't be wearing any cuffs. In other words, they wanted to be 100% sure that no one should suspect him of taking some funds from the communal money. Why? So the Talmud tells us that we Jews have the responsibility of not just being clean in the eyes of God, but even being clean in the eyes of our fellow Jew. We have to do our best that others shouldn't be talking about us. People of Israel have to be sure to be clean in the eyes of God and the eyes of their fellow Jews. Khatam Sofer notes that it's much harder the second half. Because, you know, people are are critical. So now, those days, towards with the, those seven days, when Moshe Rabbeinu is completing the process of the building of the tabernacle, Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want anyone to suspect that maybe he took some of the money. There was a lot of money floating around. So therefore, the Talmud notes that the garment he wore was one with no cuffs, the same idea that no one should suspect him of taking some of the money. Fine, this is what we are being told. Now, when we look at the last seven days of the calendar, in in some ways it it perhaps even symbolizes like the end of days. You know, for us Torah Jews, it's important that the end of days does not refer to our Armageddon or, or scary things. But it refers to an era when things are progressing in the right direction. And I'm a deep believer that the establishment of a Jewish state and the fact that so many Jews live in Israel and the fact that it's such a successful state is something that indicates that we're going, we're progressing in the right direction. Good things are happening for the people of Israel. This is what I deep, deep down believe. But what we are being told is that during such a period of time, quote unquote, end of days, there's more of a responsibility for us to be clean in the eyes of people. In other words, you know, we're, we're talking about communication and, uh, and, and, and the ability of information to flow so fast, which is an incredible gift, right? The ability that here we could sit together in a class when we're by computers and we have to have some makara satov to the Rabbanu Shalom that yes, we have one year of this of this uh, awful virus, but at the same time, HaKadosh Baruch Hu provided us for tools that I don't think we would have had 25 years ago. We wouldn't have had them. So there's what to be grateful for. Technology is incredible. And as someone that, that enjoys my Torah learning and the fact that when I wanna look something up and when years ago, I perhaps could spend 45 minutes looking for something that I remember I saw eight years ago, but I don't remember exactly where. And now within a few seconds, I could find it. Technology is incredible. And the ability for me to communicate. uh, Thursday night, we're going to have a discussion a little bit. And when we're reviewing Thursday night, the laws of Pesach, I was doing some research regarding specific seeds and kitniot. And I had a question. And I decided to email a specific professor in Germany. And the fact is that uh, it's an interesting story. But the idea that I could communicate with someone overseas and get clarity on the issue that I deep down believe that 25 years ago, authorities who wrote about it didn't know all those facts. We have these incredible tools. Like all tools, they could be used for the good. They could be used for the bad. In other words, people who forward information, you know, in other words, with WhatsApp, sometimes you get a picture that says forwarded many times. Okay, so if it's a cute joke and you uplift someone's spirit, that's good. What if it's nonsense? It's, it's not so good, right? What if it's something that's negative about someone, God forbid? Can you imagine how, how destructive that is? So 
we have to be careful with technology because fact is it became a very small world. But what I take from the fact of Moshe Rabbeinu being told that you need to be sure that when you serve during that crucial period of time, no one should be suspicious of you. Do everything in a very clean way that no one should be asking questions. In an era when so many things are covered, the Torah Jew has to upgrade the optics. The Torah Jew has to upgrade the optics. Not just do everything that is right, but do to the best of your ability, everything that even appears right. Because at a time when everyone is watching and everyone knows what is being done, it's something that demands a little bit more. So that's a, a message I've taken in the past uh, from that specific detail. Uh, but overall, when we finish Parshat Vayakel and Pkudei, the, the Ramban notes that it is a portion that ends with the tabernacle because while Shemot started off as our nation going into Galut, we are freed from Galut when we have that spiritual hub. And that spiritual hub was the Mishkan, was the Bet HaMikdash, and it's our faith that that structure will return one day to be a spiritual home for all of us and uh, to unite us as a nation. That is the goal. Thank you again, Chaim Mirel, for sponsoring. Nishama should have an Aliyah. Thank you all for participating in our discussion today.